10,000 robots, 24 hours. Can it be done? Well, yes. Actually, it's extremely easy. If you pick all the best classes with all the best loadouts on all the best maps playing only the best missions, you'll clear this benchmark without much struggle. But what if we removed all of that agency? What if instead of picking each of your own loadouts, they were chosen for you at random? What if you weren't allowed to complete the same map twice in a row, and weren't allowed to queue the same mission until a full tour had been completed? And just to chuck another lifeboat into the shredder, what if you were barred from bringing any friends along for the ride? If we put all of these restrictions in play, now can it be done? Well, looky here, it's a high tour guinea pig. Those are the main tenets of this challenge. Varied loadouts on varied maps with varied missions in varied lobbies. But to make sure there are no exploitable loopholes, we're gonna specify a couple more rules. After every completed mission, I'm forced to randomize another loadout. No duh. But what if we get such an ungodly terrible loadout on such a vital class role that it prevents every team we join into from making it to the end? I don't know. It seems a bit unreasonable to be a perpetual anchor just to get 39 kills with the pain train. So I've elected to add in a deserter clause. If over 50% of my teammates decide to leave the game for any reason, be it mission fatigue or an estranged encounter with any of MVM's all-time greats, then I too must leave the game, re and grab another randomized loadout. However, if over 50% of my teammates decide to remain in the game, regardless of circumstance, I'm barred from leaving until we either complete the mission or the prior criteria is met. Other than that, the rest is pretty self-evident. No purposefully sabotaging my team to get another crack at the wheel, no forcing other players not to use specific items that could eat into my kill potential, weapon reskins and their accompanying counterparts are interchangeable, no joining any missions in progress, and of course, no cheaters. With the commandments a go and our destination clear, it was time for us to take up the mantle. Armed with a Razor Cobra, my deteriorating mental state, and enough monster to turn my piss radioactive, I embarked on my quest to complete this never-been-done-before challenge. 10,000 robots in 24 hours. And the journey starts... right... now. What? No tickets? Okay, one sec. <gasps> This video was sponsored by War Thunder, a vehicle-based PvP shooter with incredibly dynamic gameplay. You can choose between fighting on land, on water, or in the air, with over 2,000 different tanks, helicopters, planes, and ships at your disposal. Each one modeled down to their individual components to make the combat experience more immersive. The vehicles come with an in-depth customization system, allowing for multiple different camouflage shades, 3D decorations, and historical markings, further emphasized by the game's 4K resolution potential and authentic sound design. Despite the realism, it's not all grey and brown. The variety of themes present among the different landscapes is something I'm quite a fan of. It gives each sector a lot more color. War Thunder is available on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation, and is free to play. So be sure to click my link in the description below to receive a large bonus pack including premium account status, multiple premium vehicles, an exclusive 3D decorator for those vehicles, and much more. Mission 1 started off the challenge very promisingly. Me, when I lie. Of the over 1,000 potential weapon combinations that exist within TF2, we landed on Spy with the Yur, the worst class in Man vs. Machine with the worst knife in Man vs. Machine. You couldn't have asked for a shittier appetizer. If the comments on my last video are anything to go by, a lot of people are unfamiliar to how this weapon differs in MVM. In PvP, the Your Eternal Reward instantly disguises you into whoever you just backstabbed. But because MVM robots will always be fooled by your disguise, if the Your translated one-to-one, -one, you'd 
never end up being undisguised when going in for chain stabs, and therefore would never be targeted. For that reason, Valve assumed that the instant disguise mechanic would be too overpowered for the game mode, so they added a minor delay to the disguise application upon backstabbing a robot. Might not sound like much of a big deal, but because Spy draws more aggro than Starry Crow draws dicks, this small vulnerability window is all the robot needs to knock you out of commission. With no kunai overheal and no dead ringer or big earner speed boost, my only recourse for damage mitigation was the 20% resistance provided by the invis watch. But oops, you need to consume an entire bar's worth of cloak in order to redisguise. So you better not miss a backstab, otherwise you're gonna be sitting out until that bar ticks back to full. Yeah, great. Take the worst class in the game for AoE damage and make him even more of a bench warmer. By the end of wave one, I had nine kills. Nine? Kills. At this point, I knew I was in for a rough go. I tried to get a couple of jabs in whenever the opportunity presented itself, but I couldn't help fall victim to the year's lack of on-demand disguise and non-existent survivability mechanics. Don't mind me taking all of your metal crates, Angie. It's worth it, I promise. I could just feel the resentment emanating off of my teammates as the mission went on, which is precisely why I didn't do this challenge on an alt. High tour privilege is a beautiful thing. By the end of the mission, I netted 138 kills in 46 minutes. Oh, and if you didn't guess it already, RPM stands for Robots Per Minute, a ubiquitous metric we'll be using to contrast the efficiency of each loadout. And with an RPM of exactly 3, that's about as bad as it's gonna get. But hey, it's only up from here. Mission 2 rolled us the Engineer, which, considering I did nothing but eat shit last round, was a good palate cleanser. No more getting one-tapped by rockets that weren't even aimed at me. Now we've got a machine that can play the game for us. The Pompson and Short Circuit may have been the worst options we could pull from a kill farm perspective, but it's nothing to cry over. In terms of mechanical skill, the Engineer doesn't need much. And for this challenge especially, he he benefits a lot from the spawn tour memory bank that many high tours tend to cultivate. Safe to say, I made the right flank my bitch, getting first blood on all the oncoming robots without much effort on my part. Only problem is, we began this challenge at exactly 7am on a Monday, which meant loading into servers halfway across the globe. And if you're like me, you didn't think this would come as much of a hindrance to the engineer. Turrets with auto aim don't tend to get castrated by high latency. Until you try to move them. The amount of times I right clicked on a building only for it to not get picked up was too much to count. And after years of building up specific muscle memory timings, needing to proactively account for a half second buffer was very annoying. This was an issue when using the Pompson as well, but the gun already fires like you're playing from Antarctica, so it didn't matter much. Plus, compared to all the other problems we'd face later down the road, Mode, this was relatively tame. We finished the mission with 272 kills in 36 minutes. Much better than last round. Mission 3 gave us the Medic, which in theory sounds like a disaster. In every other aspect of TF2's gameplay, Medic is a healer and strictly confined to that role, unless you want a cute gimmick for content creation couldn't be me. However, as most of you are well aware by now, Medic has a signature upgrade in the form of Projectile Shield. By the name alone, you'd expect it to be a purely defensive cooldown but it isn't. The shield is a massive, protruding AoE hitbox that ticks for 150 DPS. Not as powerful as other classes, obviously, and you won't always have the shield online, but Medic isn't as big of a detriment to the challenge as one might think. But you know what is? Two Medics. Yeah. As everyone loaded in during the pre-game setup, some random Russian dude decided to double up on the dock and refused to switch off when asked. We began the mission anyways, but before we had even a chance to soak in the implications of this team comp, one of the giant demo knights got stuck in the map. Last time I encountered this glitch was around a year ago, and was allegedly patched out a few weeks later. So I guess it got smuggled back in? I... 
I don't know. I've played about a thousand Manhattan missions in my life, and I have yet to see this pop up even once. It seems like it's a new problem. Regardless, I never established any rules as to what should happen if the game bugs out. But I figured that, because it was Wave 1, the most good faith play would be to requeue under the same conditions. The rest of my teammates agreed, including the Russian dude who this time decided not to be a duplicate medic, but a duplicate spy. Hey, more shield charge for me, I'm not complaining. For the sake of the challenge, it'd be great if they could stick around, but after they both collectively did less damage than our scout, the team wasn't having it, and they decided to send them packing. One of them even got replaced with a high tour beggar soldier, which would normally be the trait of the century, but he did end up eating through a lot of my would-be kills, so it wasn't ideal for the challenge. Accounting for both rounds, we ended with 218 kills in 49 minutes. Not bad, but hopefully we can land on something better. Really? Look, at least we avoided the caber, but this is clearly one of the worst demo rolls you could possibly get. The bottle, unlike all of the other traditional demo knight melees, has no added damage upgrade when equipped with a shield, no demo knight specific perks built into the weapon stats, and none of the increased range that comes alongside them. It wasn't all bad though. The crits and health on kill upgrades would allow us to go on the occasional sprees, and we had both a pyro and sniper that could knock out the uber medics even with my sticky launcher benched. The work I could put in was limited due to my lack of range and lack of resistances, but nonetheless, we were still able to complete Hamlet's first wave. A surprisingly high bar to clear when solo queuing. But someone didn't like me fooling around. This is Vruyi, a member of Maribot who isn't a big fan of yours truly. Upon recognizing that I was playing Bottle Knight, he decided to switch to Spy and began and AFKing the entire round as a form of protest. Naturally, this led to a vote kick the moment Wave 2 ended. But shocker, Vru Yi didn't like that very much. He immediately rejoined back into the game, switched to Pyro, and started air blasting the bomb carrier to the hatch. Normally, this is where I'd swap to Pyro myself and start playing defense, but per the rules, that was an impossibility. All I could really do was body block and try my best to kill his target before they'd cover a lot of ground. Sadly, our loadout handicap was too much to bear. Vruyi had a stranglehold over the game, and after losing us the second wave, the team's morale was understandably shot. Recognizing that he was never gonna let up, everyone dipped and triggered the deserter clause. 50 kills in 15 minutes. Not the best time. Hopefully we can now move on to greener pastures. Can I go back to demo? Mission 5, another shit loadout. Great. I ended up getting the run back on Hamlet, but unlike the last group, these guys couldn't handle wave 1. Granted, I wasn't much help either. It felt like I couldn't go 5 seconds before getting caught with my pants down. It was so bad that our team got pushed out of the frontline area before even one giant dropped onto the field. The writing on the wall was clear, and this prompted a mass exodus. It did mean I could mop up a couple of extra kills as everyone went MIA, but as a lone spot, by, it was hard to put any work in, with only 13 kills in 3 minutes. I'm gonna tangent for a moment to talk a little bit about class viability, which, for this challenge, I would categorize as something like this. You may be confused as to why 6 classes with varying AoE potentials are all in the same tier, but you have to remember we're accounting for every possible loadout that any class can randomly generate. Soldier, Sniper, and Demo are the best AoE classes in the game, but they have a lot of stinkers that can muddy up their consistency. Meanwhile, Pyro, Engineer, and Heavy all have lower AoE potential, but they also have a lower percentage of loadouts that'll come in and ruin your day. Even less damage intensive primaries like the Tommy Slav or the Degreaser are still relatively solid picks for this challenge. So as a good rule of thumb, we want to prioritize rolling these classes as much as possible. Medic is one rung below 
below the bunch because while his shield does clean house when it's active, its relatively long cooldown and varying generation speed doesn't do it any favors. Because of this, he can't contend with the other DPS classes that provide a similar output without a recharge period. And as for Scout and Spy, they can't do much for this challenge at all. Both classes have a much higher level of downtime offensively compared to everybody else. Scout in the form of being the team's breadwinner, and Spy in the form of being the team's bread loser. And also disguises. Both of them can do almost nothing crowd control wise. And while their single target damage abilities are both top notch, that's not what we need for this kind of a challenge. We want big hitboxes hitting big groups of robots with as much uptime as humanly possible. In that regard, they've got no tools whatsoever. For the first five missions of this challenge, I only landed an upper echelon class with an actually viable loadout once. So, at least in the short term, it's up to me to play catch up. Thankfully, on mission 6, the tides began to turn. While not a perfect loadout by any means, I was just finally happy to get a weapon I could shoot the ground with and win. Though I did end up going back to Rottenburg, and in hindsight, that might have been a mistake. Our pyro didn't know the strat for doubling his tank DPS, and the constant gas passer usage ate into my kill count significantly. But compared to what I had to deal with on the other classes, big whoop. By taking the high ground for maximum area coverage and controlling the flank before anyone else could get there, I finally managed to cross the 300 robot threshold within a singular mission, clocking in at a 36 minute time. Mission 7 gave us another crack at the engine, nearly a good pick, I fucking hate my life. A 1 in 6 chance to cut my kill potential in half, and it just had to happen now. It wouldn't be too bad if we were given an adequate primary for an increase in firepower, but nope, we got the support tool. So basically, I'm a battle NG without the battle. Cool. All I could really do was buy the disposable sentry upgrade and attempt to maximize how much ground I could cover. But in the end, it didn't matter. Because for the second time in less than four hours, Metro Malice bricked itself again. TF2 must be the codebase equivalent of a Jenga tower. Can't move anything without something toppling down. Regardless, the game lock happened on wave 3, so I determined this was worthy enough grounds to re with a new loadout. But not before getting 115 kills in 26 minutes. A very poor showing for what should have been a great roll, but at the very least we finally cracked the 1000 robot checkpoint. At this point though, we were still very, very far behind and we needed a good loadout to climb out of this hole. And what better class to get than... Hybrid Knight. Hmm. It was at this moment I realized that in my over 11,000 hours of playing this game, I can't recall ever trying out Hybrid Knight in PvE. This is because upgrades in MVM don't carry over from weapon to weapon. If you want a 25% damage boost on both your grenades and your stickies, those are two separate barcodes that you'll need to scan. For this reason, it's almost always preferable to dump your credits into one mega shit flinger rather than split those credits among multiple different options. Hybrid classes don't really fit MVM's mold, but I did have my choice on what path to double down on. Pipe Demo with a shield or Demo Knight with a grenade launcher. And after experiencing a trial of what an early game Demo Knight might feel like, I figured maxing out the Iron Bomber would be more optimal. And holy fuck do I love being right. I really did forget just how powerful the grenades were. Even without any damage upgrades, you're able to two shot eight out of the nine small bot variants. And the more you upgrade your primary, the faster those balls come out. Of course, the Achilles heel of the pipe demo has always been his expensive upgrade route. Getting him on par with the other DPS classes takes more funds than what's usually required. As a result, he can't pack on resistance upgrades as early or as often. Good thing I didn't need them. At the tail end of wave 1, I was able to max out my headcount from the last bunch of stray demos 
those loitering at the front. And I hung on to these heads for the entire mission. If you're not getting hit, you don't need resistances. And with the HP of a soldier, the speed of a scout, and an on-demand shield charge for the occasional fallback, I didn't get pinned down once. While the Iron Bomber doesn't have the greatest explosion radius, it's still well above average. And even then, the robot packs were so dense that it barely mattered at all. In the late game, there came a point where I did nothing but chuck bombs onto the right cliffside, barely moving an inch. And it was the most efficient bot farm I achieved thus far. For this challenge, the spammier, the better. And pipe demos got that part figured out. It was so efficient that I managed to net 414 kills in 36 minutes. A desperately needed gap closer that I was surprised worked as well as it did. Mission 9 kept our good loadout train rolling, as we landed ourselves a flog pyro. Easily the best primary we could have asked for. But with no gas on hand, that meant no medic picking. So Metro Malice was the best mission to go for. After Wave 1, there aren't any more uber medics throughout the rest of the mission so a gas passerless pyro doesn't present many shortcomings. Unfortunately, no one opted to fill that void despite me notifying them beforehand. And with two giant crit rapid-fire soldiers housing 12 medics each, we were put at a massive disadvantage. Unfortunately, it was one that couldn't be surmounted. And with the giant soldier barely managing to scrape by, they capped the bomb and prompted yet another en masse rage quit. One of the best loadout draws in the game and we had to trash it before it could reach a fraction of its potential. 30 kills in 6 minutes. Not what I hoped for in the least. But hey, we did get two good loadouts in a row. Hopefully we could get ourselves a hat trick. <sighs>Mission 10 forced us onto the Shield Bash Medic once again, and this is where I elected to be a bit more conscious of my play. Originally, I was hesitant to use Uber or share canteens with my teammates because their increased damage would encroach on my turf. I quickly realized this was a dumb mindset to have. The amount of shield charge you generate increases based on your teammates' damage output, so it's actually better to use your damage increasing abilities on your teammates, just preferably only when a giant is present. With this method, I was able to regenerate my shield extremely quickly while losing out on the least amount of kills possible. This way, I could maximize my shield's uptime when tiny robots were on the field and minimize the shield's recharge rate when they're not. I also found out that the shield will replenish in chunks if you or your target get hit, even when Ubered. It really took me over 700 tours to learn that. Even with these newfound high moments though, it's still hard for Medic to punch above his weight, tallying up to only 164 kills in 30 minutes. Mission 11 gave us our run back on Pyro. It might not be the flog, but the more damage dealers we can get, the better. Even though Metro does have the aforementioned risk of wiping in the first 10 minutes, in all likelihood, it's still the best mission we can bring him to. As long as we get past the crit soldiers in the beginning, the rest of the game can run without issue. And it did. We cleared everything with relative ease and were able to maximize on the robot barrages that Metro comes packaged with. Metro's a bit of a polarizing mission in that there are plenty of moments where you'll do nothing but focus on a single giant, dropping our RPM down to the gutter. But on the flip side, it also contains plenty of what I like to refer to as gauntlet stages, where you're rushed with a never-ending stream of small robots as the giants work their way onto the field. And because Pyro never has to reload, he can consistently match all the bots being thrown his way, more than making up for the occasional dry spells. By taking advantage of these brief moments as best we could, we ended with a very impressive haul of 389 kills in 36 minutes. Mission 12 landed us on Medic. Again. At this point, I was looking for ways to keep things interesting, and seeing as it finally reached midday, I figured it was about time to start queuing Mecha Engine. Specifically Disintegration, because it usually goes by pretty fast, and shield bashing was boring me to tears. Though, at this point in the challenge, this is where I started shield bashing the correct way. For those who don't know, if you look towards the ground while using your shield, the hitbox will actually tilt closer towards your player model, closing up the 
dead zone where you're normally left vulnerable to attacks. As long as you face downwards and keep the robots in front of you at all times, you'll be impervious to anything that doesn't attack with a flamethrower or melee weapon. I don't usually do this when recording for videos because, really, who would ever want to watch this? But for the challenge, I want to take every advantage I can get. 79 kills in 27 minutes. Let's keep going. Mission 13 once again rolled us the engineer, only this time not with a shit wrench equipped. Thank god. If we could get a replica of what happened on mission 2, that would really help compensate for all of the medic pulls we're getting. But it just so happened that, on wave 1, our pyro, the lone medic killer on the team, left the game for seemingly no reason. And upon getting swept by the giants, everyone immediately bailed. We only secured 18 kills in 3 minutes. Another effective loadout tossed into the ocean. Goody. Welp, time to spin the wheel again and oh for fuck's sake, we literally rolled almost the exact same loadout we got two missions ago. At this point in the challenge, I was starting to get pissed. We were already starting this challenge on the back foot with the cacophony of awful loadouts we were rocking at the beginning. And now, when I'm finally getting just a little bit of momentum, we go back to landing the same shit ass rolls on these nine sided dice. Just to give this boring ass play style a little bit more variety, I decided to queue for Broken Parts, a very robot-dense mission. Realistically, I shouldn't be wasting this pull on such a mid-tier class, but I needed some extra hit sounds to drown out my intrusive thoughts. For some reason, no one decided to play Engineer for the entire mission, so while the heavies kept scrounging for ammo, I got to run away with their kills. And if you think I didn't farm the fuck out of the support scouts on Wave 4, you would be very wrong. We ended up netting 199 kills in 41 minutes. Honestly, it could have been worse. Mission 15 put us right back onto Pyro, and Manhattan seemed to work well last time, may as well try it again. The back burner on this map is especially brutal. As long as your teammates are close enough to hold aggro, it's hard not to have an infinite supply of crits. At this rate, we're on track to farm just as much playtime with Pyro as we're getting with Medic. But unlike Medic, he's putting in the numbers, so I can't can't really complain. 378 kills in 41 minutes. Very good indeed. But of course, Mission 16 just has to ruin our fun with another proc of the Mini Sentry NG. It feels like I can't complete two full missions in a row without a bad loadout shoving itself in afterwards. At least the generator was courteous enough to give us an actual shotgun this time around, but I'm so fucking tired of looking at this metal arm. Luckily, I didn't have it on for all too long, because I found myself queuing into a group that was just as hasty as I was to get the mission over with. The F4s on every wave from every player were borderline instant, and while the team's heightened experience level did take a lot of my kills, they more than made up for it with how fast we plowed through the mission. We finished with 181 robots in 25 minutes, which for Bavarian Bot Bash is extremely fast, literally only 4 minutes behind the world record speedrun. That's the power of fast F4s. They arguably move the needle even more than a good loadout does. Which I'm obviously gonna get. Mm. Okay. Can someone please explain to me how I've gotten Medic on five different occasions, yet Scout, Sniper, and Heavy are all 0 for 17? And even ignoring that, I've rolled every Medigun in the game except for the Quick Fix, the one Medigun that trounces every other option in the domain of shield bashing by a fucking mile. I know there are worse positions I could theoretically be in, but every time I'm forced into locking Medic, the gap between my projected kill count and my actualized kill count gets wider and wider and wider. I keep waiting to get a series of loadouts that might just be able to chew through the deficit, but every time there's a fork in the road that halts any potential headway I could make. Whatever, I'm done talking about the intricacies of shield bashing. Could write a PhD thesis on this shit by now. 194 kills in 36 minutes, get me out of this goddamn purgatory. Ah, <sighs> salvation. After over 8 hours of the randomizer being prejudiced against Australians, they finally threw us a bone. But not just any bone, the biggest bone. The Hitman's Heatmaker, arguably the best weapon in all of MVM, with the Cozy Camper, Sniper's best secondary in MVM, with an open mission on Big Rock. 
Sniper's best map in MBM. Now I really feel like a moron for wasting broken parts on Medic, but Bone Shaker's a good bid nonetheless. Even better, the engineer decided to place his dispenser right next to the rock so ammo management was no longer a concern. What was a concern, though, was the fact that I sucked shit as Sniper. Most of the time, I was just waiting for the easy-to-hit heavies to make their way into my sightline so I could farm residual kills off their easily trackable hitboxes. We also had two gas passer pyros on the team, and I couldn't beat them to the punch on many of the harder-to-hit targets, but even the more lackluster segments still gave a much-needed boost. 416 kills in 34 minutes, our highest RPM yet. Hopefully the bad RNG marathon ends here. Hopefully I start shutting my mouth. Can we please go more than one hour without a shank, a metal arm, or a radiation rectangle? No bullshit? I'm not having fun anymore. Of all the repeat loadouts the cockeye generator could possibly give us, it just had to be the gunslinger and the yur. I made do with what I could and was getting the rotations down a bit better, but we're still playing spy in an AoE focused challenge with a broken leg. Two broken legs, actually. Yeah, remember how I bitched about not having the Dead Ringer last time? What the fuck was I thinking? This shit is way worse. The Dead Ringer prevents you from getting any cloak via ammo boxes or dispensers. So, in order to redisguise and have the Dead Ringer available when rushing in, you need to wait not one, but two full cloak durations in order to safely enter the fray. I still went for whatever chain stabs I could and tried to make better use of my sapper, but at a certain point I gave up and just started being an aggro bitch to get the mission over with as quickly as possible. Surprisingly, we did end up with 185 kills in 42 minutes, which frankly was way more than I expected. Thankfully, that walk through the desert had an oasis at the end, as mission 20 rewarded us with another shot at the pipe demo. With my mecha tour reset, broken parts online, and queues popping in 5 Five minutes or less, I knew this would be the play to make. Especially considering the extreme surplus of credits that the Big Rock missions provide. Pipe Demo just keeps on winning. I did find myself queuing onto a team of low tours, which did mean long wait times between waves, but that also meant that no one knew how to upgrade properly, so while they were eating shit due to not having crit resistance, I had free reign over the board. That was until a tank appeared. And because no one knew the proper strategy, to melt it down efficiently, I had to sacrifice some of my kills to go help them out. Despite the constant low tourisms, the mission actually went extremely well. We progressed without any wave losses, albeit there were a few close calls, and for the second time in this challenge, we completed Broken Parts Wave 6, first try, again, without an engineer. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. The whole mission was a very pleasant surprise, and it showed in the numbers. 362 kills in 41 minutes. Mission 21 put us back onto the engineer, and thank god, no more mini sentries. Might have been a tad risky to bring this loadout to Hamlet, especially once I learned that our only medic picker was a zero tour pyro, but we were able to keep the bomb in view and avoid a wave one shit show, keeping the group intact. One thing that became very apparent very quickly is that even for this challenge, the rank is still broken as shit. I never fully realized just how many encounters a wrangled sentry could live through that a non-wrangled one couldn't. It obviously increased my sentry survivability versus giants, but it also upped my kill count way more than I thought it would. You can play way more aggro and put your sentry in more precarious positions without any kind of direct DPS penalty. And it paid off. We finished the mission with 279 kills in 20 29 minutes, a much higher RPM than our previous NG sessions while on a much less robot dense mission. It may have taken 10 hours, but we finally completed two full missions with back to back good loadouts.
I just jinxed it, didn't I? Direct hit soldier. Here we fucking go. In a challenge centered around maximizing AoE potential, the rocket launcher with a 70% splash damage reduction is the draw we're forced onto. I wasn't sure how things would play out, to be honest. The direct hit may have a crippling, weapon-defining downside, but at the end of the day, it's still a rocket launcher. It can't be that bad. That was my thought process until we hit the end of wave 2, where I collected a grand total of 28 kills up to that point. Looks like desperate times call for desperate measures, so I attempted to do something that I have never done before. I maxed out Rocket Specialist. The Horror. Typically in Man vs. Machine, you only want one tick of the rocket spec upgrade as that's enough to remove all damage falloff and apply the rocket stun on hit, the two most important elements of this four-pronged upgrade. However, what many people don't know is that each added tick of the upgrade comes with a 15% boost to your rocket's explosion radius, which usually isn't worth 300 credits, but for this challenge, what other choice do we have? You you still have to be far more precise than any other rocket launcher, but being 100% on the money every time is no longer required. Though, with the very heavy cost of 900 credits, maxing it out severely hampered our damage capabilities. Similarly to the Mini Sentry Engineer, the direct hit cuts our killing efficiency to around 50% of what it otherwise would be, getting only 230 kills in 40 minutes. Pretty rough. Mission 23 finally gave us our first crack at Scout. So close. Yeah, we're taking this one back to decoy because I have no clue how I'm supposed to make this work. You'd think that the Criticola being invalidated by the Backscatter's mini crits would be the main issue, but with how often I was getting targeted for camping behind the robots, I wasn't landing them much to begin with. For that reason, the Criticola filled more of a niche than expected, until the soldier switched to the buff banner and we traded one redundancy for another. It was obvious from the get-go that this would be an abject waste of a loadout, and that's why we took it to the shortest mission in the game. We got 51 kills in 18 minutes, our worst RPM for the challenge so far, but at least it was short-lived enough for it to not be too big of a pain point. Mission 24 finally gave us some good fun fucking food. The second best rifle in the game with an open tab on Big Rock. What could go wrong? Well, from the onset, it appeared quite a lot. This is Chrono, a name I remember all too well. A few months ago, I ended up queuing into a last wave decoy mission with him acting very strange. Similarly to many griefers showcased on this channel, Chrono AFK'd the entire round, threw the game repeatedly, and refused to elaborate as to why he was doing so. Alongside him were two idle spies, which I can only presume were alt accounts, and Mus, a former Tacobot member. I'm not 100% sure as to whether or not this was a coordinated attack against me specifically, or they were beefing with each other and I just happened to wander into their escapades. Either way, these types of vengeful MVM players are usually very unpleasant figures, no matter which side they're on. And coincidentally, just a few hours prior to this challenge commencing, a very interesting post was made on Reddit, exposing Chrono for acting like a schizo in DMs towards another player. In fairness, he later provided a detailed response to these accusations that does make the situation appear more grey. But I'll be real, I couldn't give less of a shit about this drama. At least the chat logs are funny. You, Cheesy, and Dr. Butthole have no idea what you've done. I think it goes without saying that I wasn't too thrilled about spending the next half hour with this guy. But Chrono must have taken his meds or something because throughout the entire mission, he was completely chill. Everyone in the group was very experienced, so the downtime between waves was almost non-existent. But if you know anything about high tour mecha players, it's that they don't fuck around when it comes to spawn camping. The moment there was a potential kill sound opportunity, every team member would rush towards it like a pack of starving hyenas. Now, if you're a top tier sniper player, you can beat them to the punch, but I struggle 
struggle to hit AFKers meandering on control points, so I wasn't privy to that perk. Never mind the fact that even if I was aimbot incarnate, the engineer played very aggressively. So aggressively that the sentry busters wouldn't stop gassing up my screen. With all those factors combined, it meant I couldn't take advantage of this loadout in any meaningful capacity. But on the flip side, it was a wicked fast mission. 195 kills in 28 minutes. Not bad, but definitely below expectations for one of the better roles thus far. Mission 25 dropped us another actually good loadout. Only this time, the conditions were the complete opposite of the prior mission. Instead of getting a highly competent team with very fast F4s, the vast majority of the team consisted of low tours who would F4 at a snail's pace. On the bright side, it did mean a fuckload more kills for me. In this game of hungry hungry high tours, I was the winner. Granted, I'm hardly the MBM messiah, so we did end up failing two ways regardless. Regardless. Thankfully, my team never abandoned ship. Every segment of the map became a slaughterhouse that I held the least to. There wasn't a single spawn point in the mission that I wasn't locking down consistently. It took a while to get our run back with an unhindered DPS class, but we got it. Shooting the ground to win never felt so good. It was so good in fact that for the first and only time within this challenge, I managed to surpass 500 robots on a single mission. Though the lack of F4s and multiple wave failures set us back 50 55 minutes. This was enough to finally break through the halfway point of the challenge, though we were still very much behind schedule. Mission 26 landed us back on Sniper, but this time with... The Huntsman. I wasn't really sure how this one would go. My default assumption was that the bow's lack of explosive headshot would be a game changer, but not in a good way. However, the arrows did have the plus of being easier to land than headshot, so I was very curious as to how this would affect our output. I hypothesized that the efficiency floor may be comparable to the rifles, but the ceiling would be much lower. Nevertheless, I opted to run back to broken parts to test it out. Projectile penetration is where much of the Huntsman's utility stems from, and a robot-dense mission like Broken Parts on a map with plenty of straightaways can lend it well to those massive collateral chains. At least, it would if we didn't get the exact same group of high tours I played with an hour ago. There goes my experiment. Even with one of the high tours joining me in a newfound Bowman bromance, it was hard to land any bullseyes at all. Like our last round of Big Rock, I couldn't do shit. 198 kills in 34 minutes. Not as high of an RPM as our rifle bid with the same team, but again, it could have been worse. For the time being though, we'll be taking an extended break from Big Rock. The queue times were getting way too unbearable. Mission 27 gave us the engineer once again, and this hot streak has been pretty good so far. The lows haven't gone on too long, I haven't had to shield bash in over 5 hours, and I'm getting a chance at redemption for what happened on mission 13, where the team disintegrated on the first wave and wasted our coveted engineer role. Unless we're exceedingly unlucky, good chance that won't happen this time. Uh-oh. Yep, Vruyi was back, and boy did he not forget my alias, instantly moving to grief our lobby with no remorse. Now, under any other circumstance, I'd find this very annoying. The constant wave failures lose us shitloads of time, knocking back robots puts them way out of our attack range, and even attempting to stop Vruyi in his tracks would give my RPM a good beating. But for this challenge, there's no better class you can land on than the Engineer. Griefer or not, my sentry still gonna be auto-attacking any robot in range, and Vruyi opting to not attack the robots himself meant I had less competition for the lion's share of the mobs. It did mean I had to abstain from buying two-way teleporter though. He'd get way more use out of it than I would. Obviously, that alone wasn't enough of a preventative measure, and with little adversity from my fellow teammates, Vruyi successfully lost us the first wave once again. Of course, I immediately called a vote kick to get this bastard 
out of the game, to which all of the low tours unanimously voted against it. I'm getting a bit of deja vu here. With Vru Yi now in full control of my short bus of a team, the goal from here on out was to maximize the upcoming bot farm as efficiently as possible. The sentry spots were obvious, I may as well have them tattooed on my ass. But what I didn't expect was just how much of a difference maker the Frontier Justice would end up being. I still maintain that it usually doesn't provide as much utility as the Rescue Ranger or Widowmaker, but for Empire in particular, the crit mead shots went crazy. This was largely down to the robot layouts working to our advantage big time. Pyros, Demo Knights, and Bowmen are the easiest fodder we could get. And with the crit storage being constantly replenished, it was rare to not be a powerhouse myself. This was one of the biggest reasons why, during our second attempt at Wave 1, Vru Yi was unable to sink us and we completed the wave in spite of his griefing. By the end of the wave, the low tours finally learned how to use their peripheral vision and and flip their votes against him. But because Valve can't properly implement soft bans to save their life, Vru Yi was back and would continue his reign of terror. Again, this would usually be very irritating, but I racked up over 200 kills before Wave 2 even began. At least I'm having fun. If Vru Yi wants to blow the bowman up top, be my guest. I'll just stay down here and pop Berserker stance. It's all gravy. After air blasting the giants up to point A, I figured it'd be worth it to scope out his motive. What reason does he have for going after me so fervently? His response, because I completed missions with cheaters for my original video on the matter, which I remind you happened in February of 2022, nearly two whole years later and he's still hanging on to it. That is his rationale for not just griefing me, but over a dozen unaffiliated third parties that are unrelated to the grievance at hand. These kinds of people are genuinely impaired. I later did a bit of digging and found that Vru Yi was banned on Backpack.tf under the guise of maintaining a kick list. So it is possible he was a former Taco Bot member at some point, but the Wayback Machine didn't turn up any proof of that, so jury's still out on that one. I've been commended many times on my patience in dealing with these clowns, but the reality is their vengeance-fueled tantrums only serve to benefit my channel. In fact, do me a favor guys, drop a like on this video and sub to the channel if you're not already. Let me rub this shit in, because I know for a fact these people hate nothing more than to see me benefit off their own mental derangement. Unbeknownst to Vru Yi, we'd been doing that the whole challenge, but as time went on, it became increasingly more difficult to do so. On the latter half of Wave 2, you'll face off against two giant black box soldiers. If any of their rockets hit you, they'll replenish a portion of their HP. Vru Yi was well aware of this and purposefully got hit with each rocket expulsion to keep the giants on indefinite life support. This also applied fall off to everyone's damage, preventing the team from bursting them down within the interval between rockets. I tried to use my short circuit to alleviate this, but it was to no avail. They were the bane of my team's existence, but more importantly, the bane of our challenge. There were almost no support bots to go around while Vru Yi was toying with the giants. So when they showed up, my RPM began to crater. This eventually culminated in two separate wave failures, but my team was vigilant. They kept the mission afloat, though they did vote to restart from wave 1. Which honestly, I didn't see much of a point in, but hey, no more black box soldiers. I'm game. In the end, it was just as fruitless as expected. Vru Yi turned it up and tossed another three wave failures onto the pile. Our team even decided to grab a pyro of our own to air blast against him, but it didn't matter. We couldn't hold him off. After a combined total of six wave losses, that's when everyone called it quits and finally gave us the ability to leave the game. By the end of his tirade, we netted 362 kills in 47 minutes. Could have gone better, but of any time to get an engineer pull, I'm glad it was there. Mission 28 kept our streak alive with another sniper pull, but little did I expect, the asshole train wasn't ready to leave the station. 
sin. As it turns out, one of our teammates had committed a grave sin, an unacceptable atrocity within the bounds of Man vs. Machine. He decided to play Pyro. Apparently, that warranted going AFK, throwing the game, and spending the wave calling each other gay furries in chat. I don't think I've ever gotten back-to-back -back griefed missions built on bullshit rationalizations, but unlike the prior round, Hamlet Wave 1 isn't a good venue for capitalizing on a player's insanity. The High Tour gave the group an ultimatum, the Pyro or him, and because we're not tribalistic crazies, we didn't accept those terms. So that meant more AFKing, more dying, another group-wide rage quit, and another good loadout ripped from our palms. 35 kills in 7 minutes. Mission 29 finally gave us our shot at heavy. Better 15 hours into the challenge than never. Such a mechanically easy class with a mechanically easy game plan. It'd be nearly impossible to mess this up if I had a competent team. But as we all know, that's a pretty big if. And with only 5 players, no engineer, and a low tour pyro for medic killing, this had all the makings of an early game roach out. With this being my first heavy loadout, I really did not want it to go to waste. All I could hope for was that whoever joined our game in progress would pick NG and push us to an easy victory. And, yep, he pushed us alright. For the third fucking time in this godforsaken challenge, Vru Yi has once again come to ruin our day. I can't re queue, I can't switch classes, I can't bring in a friend to help keep him busy. Looks like we're trapped in dickhead purgatory for the time being. He didn't actively sabotage the game at first, he simply pulled the last guy's shtick of becoming an AFK spy and letting the mission drown. But once we were ready to take another swing at it, that's when the flamethrower came out for business as usual. Unlike on the Engineer game, Vru Yi was actually posing a problem this time around. Heavy is very much reliant on damage ramp up to maximize his kill count, and with everything getting flung around in 18 different directions, I couldn't maintain the momentum I needed. On any other team, this would have been unsalvageable, but with a group almost entirely encompassed of low tours, even a crippled minigun will outcompete the competition. We were able to overpower him on the first wave, but that meant another inning with the black box soldiers on wave 2. And it was up to me to do all that I could to keep them at bay. Body blocking was a fool's errand, ditto with attempting to burst them down via max ramp up. So my only option was to stock up on crit canteens and pray that'd be enough to burn them down before they'd reach the hatch. In retrospect, I didn't play this too well. I got way too hasty in chasing the giants where they were at, which opened up Vru Yi to push them out of my line of sight, giving them just enough time to cap the bomb. Of course, I immediately motioned to call a vote kick once the wave was over, and in a crazy, unexpected turn of events, he wasn't able to rejoin. For the first and only time within this challenge, we've been able to successfully gatekeep Vru Yi from the mission he was ousted from. Wouldn't it be great if the system always worked like this? In any case, we could finally let our mini gun play the game for us and progress through the mission as normal. I was a bit mentally checked out at this point, but you can probably play heavy on a Super Nintendo controller, so it didn't make much of a difference. Not the most amount of AoE potential when compared to the other classes, but he gets the job done. 379 robots was the final count, but due to Vruyi's griefing, the mission went on for 58 minutes. Not the most ideal RPM for such a powerhouse class, but hopefully we've generated some some good karma for putting up with that. <sighs> Well, it was about time I was forced back into the Shield Bash prison, because of course, that's what I need right now. Rocket launchers, sticky bombs, rifles, miniguns, those are for chumps. Let's all stand rectum to rectangle while staring at the floor for half an hour. Clearly the peak of what MVM has to offer. 158 kills in 31 minutes. Another fork in the road. But on the bright side, we did get a professional killstreak rainblower kit. Huh. The universe does listen. Mission 31 put us back on course with Pyro, and back to Manhattan we go. It's a tried and true strategy that may be a bit repetitive, but we really need to start gunning for the easy, high RPM increases. Map variety be damned. And hey, we finally got a good loadout without needing to deal with a griefer's ego-satiating crusade. Unfortunately, it didn't go as smoothly as planned. A couple of players on the team decided to leave for what appeared to be no reason 
reason at all, which prompted all of the other players to restart the mission? I don't know why we did this, but whatever, I was overruled. There are worse classes this could have happened on, but I was just so over wasting any more unnecessary time. 387 kills in 48 minutes. A pretty good haul. Who knows, maybe the streak's back on. You know, maybe I should stop talking. In almost every way possible, this has to be one of the worst loadouts you could possibly nab for this challenge. I can't stress just how unfun the babyface's blaster is within MVM. If using this gun in PvP turns every enemy into a Natasha heavy, using it in MVM feels like fighting 15 Natasha heavies at once. That's even ignoring how we landed on the pistol and the bat for our other weapon slots. Probably the two worst bids we could have asked for. My only chance at landing a finishing blow was to land a close range meat shot on already damaged robots. It's like that with all of Scout's primaries, but you could always jump in and out of the danger zones at will. But the BFB, it doesn't fuck with that whole verticality thing. So because I couldn't jump in to mitigate damage without losing my boost, I had to reinvest in resistances to even survive the close range altercations. My damage was nerfed, my movement was nerfed, and I still had to run around and collect money for the team. I would have labeled this mission the definitive low point of the challenge, if not for the godlike team I had been blessed with. They were incredibly competent with very fast F4s, so the mission didn't linger on too long. And thank god for that, because we only managed 91 kills in 27 minutes. Thankfully, we got our old reliable back on mission 33, with a near identical loadout to the prior pyro loadout we were given. Didn't shake up the gameplay all that much, but it's no big deal. I'm just happy to finally get a loadout that gave decent RPM for a wave and a half. Yeah, the moment we lost point A and began getting pounded by the soldier packs, my teammates weren't too keen on sticking around. Once everyone but one dude decided to call it quits, I had to fold this ace once again, with only 59 kills in 12 minutes. Mission 34 at least gave us the run back on sniper. Just a shame we're back to using medieval weaponry. The one sniper primary in the game without explosive headshot, and we've rolled it twice now. Something tells me this generator is bugged. I opted for bot bash because there aren't any uber meds, and Rottenberg seems like it'd play well to the huntsman's niche. The bows are all about lining up as many robots as possible and headshotting all of them in one go with the penetration upgrade. With bot bash having no shortage of low health targets alongside the robots following the bomb in a near uniform path, the chain kills were rolling in like mad. Though, fun fact, the huntsman has this bug where if you ever buy the projectile penetration upgrade, and just so happen to be shooting while invulnerable, the arrows will miraculously... break. I have no clue why this happens, but it seems like this might be one of the only cases in TF2 where our medic ubering me actually negatively impacted my kill count. I actually had to shoo the medic away from me a couple of times, which I never thought I'd have to do. But besides that, I think the arrows aren't too bad for this challenge. I was still relatively frail, and the Huntsman's comparatively strained AoE potential didn't help matters, but I achieved about what I was expecting. 270 78 kills in 33 minutes. Now, if I could get an AoE class without a debilitating primary for this challenge, that'd be great. I might kill a man someday. Mission 35 was another direct hit pull. Just fucking great. Pour more gasoline on me while you're at it. Fuck, I wish. Whatever, I just went with the same maxed out rocket specialist plan I used in mission 22. The results ended up being pretty similar. 204 kills in 33 minutes. At this point in the challenge, I was burying my face in my hands. I mean, just look at this chapter alone. We've had three griefed missions, a good loadout, we had to chuck 20% through the mission, a shit loadout, a subpar loadout, and two games in a row where I get weapons that are the antithesis of each class's AoE potential. After this conga line of ass whoopings, I needed to take a break and do some calculations. I genuinely didn't have any idea as to where my standing was within the challenge. Frankly, I was unsure if it was even possible to win based on how much we were trailing our projected numbers. And let's be real, this was entirely my own doing. I didn't strategize nearly at all in choosing the most appropriate missions. I flat out of 
avoided a couple of good options just to avoid lengthy queue times, and when given a shitty draw, I wasn't tryharding as much as I probably should have been. I treated the challenge like winning was an inevitability. Clearly me, the MVM guy, should face no adversity in dunking on 10,000 robots like it was nothing. Ego was beckoning my downfall, and after running the numbers, it was clear I had to get my act together. Time-wise, we were 76.9% of the way through the challenge. Yet robot-wise, we only achieved 74.4% of the total amount of kills. Now, that differential might not seem all that bad, but we're on borrowed time here. And across the past 35 missions, our average RPM was only 6.81. In order to complete the challenge, we needed to up that ratio to 7.7, .7, a 13% increase over the next five and a half hours. This was definitely doable, but we can't rely on luck alone to get us there. From this point onwards, we needed to be choosing our maps carefully. The two big missions we want to maximize to the fullest are Broken Parts and Bavarian Bot Bash, as they have the highest amount of robot density within them. These are the big ticket plays where we should only be bringing the most efficient classes available. Hamlet Hostility and Disintegration, on the other hand, will be doing the exact opposite. These are the two shortest missions in the game, so we'll be using them to burn through the shittier loadouts we want to minimize our uptime with. Empire, Metro, and Bone Shaker will be sprinkled in whenever the Playmaker missions aren't available. 7.7 .7 RPM. That's the benchmark we need to meet. This is our comeback. No more fucking around. Nothing is gonna stop us from breaking this challenge in two. Ah. Uh... Right off the bat, I needed to burn one of my throwaway missions, so Hamlet Hostility, we went. With time being of the essence and our credit pool more constrained, I had to try a different strategy to not fall even further behind. So I played this round a little bit differently than the previous spy missions. Every single time I died, no matter the occasion, I would stock up on ammo refill canteens. Now, this sounds pretty dumb. The knife doesn't use any ammo, and we've been keeping the revolver in our pocket the whole time. Why would ammo canteens do anything at all? Well, a lot of people are completely unaware that these canteens instantly restore the charge of your sapper. So for every 25 credits I churn out, I'm given a free AoE stun that I can pop whenever I want. This would guarantee me at least a couple of stabs whenever the field was empty. And with how much our team got pushed back, I had plenty of opportunities to make use of it. But that's not all. I I decided to double down on dumpstering credits for the sake of avoiding downtime and started immediately buying back whenever I died. And you know what? It worked. Kinda. Obviously, I was not doing my job well. Even my gargantuan tour count couldn't turn any heads away from my obvious lacking performance. But in relation to the challenge, this playstyle upped our kill count like crazy. The other two spy missions I fully completed had an RPM of 3 and 4 respectively. But for mission 36, this strategy netted me 206 kills in 34 minutes. An RPM over 50% higher than my previous best. Not what I needed to tilt the scales in our favor, but this didn't hurt anywhere close to what I initially expected. You know what? I think spy I wasn't given a fair shot. You can join Medic in B tier, my friend. Ah, oh, fuck, I spoke his name. Well, it looks like we're burning through our second throwaway mission in a row. This is pretty bad news for the challenge. If we get another shitty loadout within the next couple of rolls, we'll need to bring it to an actually good mission. I did try to experiment and find some kind of hidden tech to up my kill count like I did for Spy, but nothing really came to mind. The best I could do was spam uber canteens on myself to get a couple more melee bot kills every now and again. But I think that goes without saying that it didn't affect the outcome come all that much. Worst part was the entire group consisted of low tours, so two minute long upgrade breaks became the norm, at least until I started spamming the ready up voice line midway through the mission. That's right, fear my impatience. You wouldn't want to upset the high tour. 
would you? We ended with 112 kills in 20 minutes. Not a great pull. With the two shortest missions off the table, we needed a loadout that could take advantage of the maps we had left and Mission 38 gave us exactly that. There's no world where we get a default sniper rifle and not take our ass back to Big Rock. But even with both mission boxes checked, it still took us over 30 minutes to find a game. I think you're all beginning to understand why I took a break from Mecha. But then, something happened. For whatever reason, my frame rate in OBS got shot into the fucking ocean while the mission was getting underway. So I had to direct some of my attention away from the game to figure out what the issue was. My team clearly wouldn't get swept within literally the first minute of the wave, right? I'm never being optimistic ever again. A low tour team with a player down on a laggy ass Virginia server spelled disaster the moment I couldn't contribute. After half an hour of waiting in queue, the group evaporated immediately after the wave loss, eviscerating my beautiful Big Rock combo. 66 kills in 6 minutes. What a fucking waste. Thankfully, Mission 39 put us back in the game with yet another shot at Pyro. For a while, it was looking like Medic was going to end up being our fallback class, but I'm very happy to be wrong. We found ourselves on a high tour team, and the prevalent trade-off was there. Expeditious F4s, but a lot of kill nabbing. However, the jetpack actually worked to counteract this much more than I anticipated. High tours have each mission down to a science, so they're known for preemptively getting into position for each robot spawn. And while I couldn't really win those positioning races, I was always riding their tails. Enough to let me compete for kills that I otherwise would have missed. Still wasn't enough to be a massive peak, but it was relatively above board. 260 kills in 36 minutes. Mission 40 gave us Soldier once again. And man, it really feels like I can't catch a break when it comes to any other class besides Pyro. Yeah, give me the rockets with an explosion radius of a grapefruit and then give me the rocket launcher that may as well be firing them instead. Nonetheless, I did decide to use my bot bash pick on this one because risking a shittier mission could have hurt us way more. And while this loadout was amazing in giving us borderline free mobility, the damage nerf really took its toll. 25% is a massive burden to deal with. Robots that would normally get two shotted now require three, both decreasing my kill expediency while simultaneously increasing my need to reload. Luckily, we can offset that by the endless soldier flood that happens on wave 2, where even despite the rocket's damage nerf, we can still farm dozens of kills per minute. Or I would be able to, if not for the fact that we had not one, but two heavies on the team. A very unusual comp for Bot Bash. Because miniguns do fuck all damage to tanks, that meant the responsibility was on me to focus them down. Later on in the wave, one of the heavies did switch over over to Pyro, so it wasn't a concern moving forward, but it's not an exaggeration to claim that this one tank might have costed me like 75 kills. We eventually were able to upgrade the Liberty Launcher to the point of two-shotting most robots, but it really did feel like we were playing with a wave's worth of credits behind. At the end of the day though, a nerfed rocket launcher is still a rocket launcher, and upon completing the mission, we managed 369 kills in 33 minutes. Nothing serious to complain about. Okay, now we can complain. Per the rules, I'm unable to go back to Rottenburg after completing the last mission, and Decoy also isn't on the table, so it looks like we're shield bashing on Metro for the time being. At the very least, we got the vaccinator so I could purposefully let my teammates die and instantly revive them for immediate shield charge. I debated on whether or not this should be allowed, as one could argue it does break the no sabotage rule, but with the vaccinator specifically, I don't really agree. You're giving the entire team a substantial benefit for a tiny, tiny loss in DPS. Personally, I think it's fair game. The gauntlets were where I got most of my kill mileage, particularly on waves 4 and 5. But in the end, it just didn't cover enough ground. 176 kills in 35 minutes. Yet another mission below the 7.7 .7 RPM that we needed. At this point, I was beginning to worry. We're 3 hours into the challenge since we last calculated the numbers, and not only have we not increased our RPM at all, but we've actually slightly gone backwards. 
words. We already had such a low margin for error, and now it's getting even worse. We're down to the fucking wire on this one. We need, NEED an optimal loadout now more than ever. Oh, that sucks. My run might be over. That's a really bad loadout. When all the chips are on the table and I need a roll for the ages, we land on Scout. But not just any Scout, a BFB Scout with two completely irrelevant sidearms, again. When this roll dropped into our lap, my morale went into the shitter. I had a plan, I was executing it well, but the one factor outside of my control, RNG, shit the bed when it mattered most. At this point, I felt very defeated, but we already grinded out 21 hours. No point in giving up now. I needed to get my head straight and figure out how I could get myself a low-tier layup. And I knew exactly who to call. One minute? No! Oh! This is Peanut. He's the best Little Mac player in the world, and if you know anything about Smash Bros, you know this character sucks dick. If there was anyone in the world who could help me succeed with this loadout, it'd be Peanut. If there was anyone in the world who could adjust my mental for this mission, it'd be Peanut. If there was anyone in the world who knew how to salvage such an unfortunate role, it would be Peanut. Honestly, dude, I think you should just kill yourself. With those wise words of encouragement, I was finally ready to step back into Rottenburg. At the very least, Hamlet was open, so I wasn't forced to trudge it out on a longer mission, but I swear it felt like half of my kills just came from camping the sniper bots. They were the only tags I could get without issue. And look, this loadout sucks shit out of the balls of Christ. No one will deny that. But my prayers for better RNG had at least been somewhat answered. I got a fair bit of experienced players on the team that all F4 almost immediately. A stroke of good luck that we desperately needed. I also opted to spam buybacks as we did on the last Hamlet mission. I figured that if it helped our spy gameplay, it'd probably move the needle in a similar fashion for Scout. My gameplay eventually revolved around being wherever my team wasn't, even if that meant only getting a couple of kills periodically. It was better than having them all mopped up before I had a chance to get there. This was especially the case on the last wave. Well, while everyone focused on the three tanks, I was camping the front lines for any prey I could get my hands on. This four minute period was responsible for around a third of my total kills. And I've said it before, it could have been way worse. We netted 150 kills in 26 minutes. Still a massive downgrade, but we do have more work to be done. We began this chapter weak, picked up strong in the middle, and finished even weaker than when we started. However, not all hope is lost. That Hamlet mission ended up completing our tour, bringing every two cities mission back into eligible grounds. Most notably, Bot Bash, one of our priority missions. And that's not all. We still had the Bone Shaker mission left on the Mecha Engine side of things. So if we could get a good loadout for Bone Shaker and complete that mission, we would reset the tour and bring Broken Parts, a priority mission, and Disintegration, a throwaway mission, back online. Then, after getting those missions into eligible status, we can go back to two cities and play Bavarian Bot Bash for maximum RPM, then go back to Mecha and queue for broken parts for maximum RPM there as well. And if we ever get a shitty loadout, we can use our disintegration bid to minimize the amount of time we have to spend using it. 1,225 robots in 143 minutes. That is what we need. The ice we're skating on is so thin, it's practically breaking beneath our feet. This, for real this time, is our last chance. We just need one good loadout. Okay. Okay. Thank God. Listening to my reaction, you may have assumed that my elatement came from rolling the Scottish Resistance, but the whole time, I was eyeing the lock and load Islander combo. I hadn't forgot about Mission 8 at the beginning of the challenge, which was one of my highest RPMs throughout this whole journey. Going in, I was fully expecting to do another round of hybrid knighting just without a shield, but then my high tour brain knocked some sense into me and realized maxing the sticky launcher was the much better call. especially 
especially on Big Rock where literally everything comes out of one cave, and we have an easy perch to set up stickies from. It was actually quite similar to how we'd exploit Explosive Headshot. A bit more setup involved, sure, but in exchange, aim became a non-factor. That didn't mean we were going to ignore the Islander though. We wanted those heads as early as possible, and thanks to the spy bots that showed up, we managed to farm three heads before wave one even ended. The speed increase would give us much needed agility to get out of dodge if I ever drew too much aggro. Thankfully, it didn't happen all that much. I had the cave locked down pretty much the entire mission. As long as my sticky piles were spread out enough, very little would survive. We even had a flog pyro, which meant I never had to waste any time getting on tank duty. Meet the new rock, same as the old rock. I did this virtually the entire mission, camping the left side of the map and detonating whenever a robot orgy was plastered in front of me. It was free, it was easy, and it also took way longer than one would hope for. One of our teammates ditched us at the beginning of wave 1, and because it was late at night, we didn't get a replacement until wave 5. Gameplay wise, this wasn't really an issue. Our team was relatively competent, and I'll never bitch about having one less player to compete for kills with. However, in MVM, Valve has a check in place to where you can't begin a wave with 5 players, even if everyone decided to ready up. This this costed us 5 minutes over the course of the mission, which may not seem all that bad, but that's over 3% of our remaining time that we just had to throw away for basically no reason. Regardless, we still managed to get through the mission with little issue, especially on wave 6 where we could one-shot the giants by using crit sticky piles with a two-way teleporter. It didn't add much to the kill count, but it shaved off a fuckload of time. Of all possible instances to get the Scottish resistance, it couldn't have come at a better time. In the end, we netted 375 robots in 37 minutes. A much needed boost, but with bad RNG, it could be too little too late. My track record on getting two good loadouts in a row has been shoddy to put it mildly. At no point in the past 22 hours have I gotten two loadouts that netted 300 kills back to back. And with 850 kills needed in at least 106 minutes, we would need to break that curse if we ever wanted to survive another low tier roll. And who else to break that curse but Pyro. Flog Pyro. Wait, that's actually kind of a problem. The flog is one of the best weapons in MVM, and especially for this challenge. But it also happens to be a bit at odds with our current strategy. Of all 195 weapons in TF2, the flog is ranked number one when it comes to melting down tanks. So if I queued into bot bash and this was the primary I was wielding, everyone would be expecting me to gorilla glue myself to the tanks. If I didn't, that could potentially cause issues. I looked at this as way too risky a move to pull this late into the challenge. So we took our ass back to the combo that served us well the whole time. And just to be extra safe, I maxed out my crit canteen so I could take care of the uber medics with the third degree if needed. Thankfully, it wasn't. After playing with the standard flamethrowers so often, I forgot just how much the flog carries your damage. The constant streams of crits let us get those finishing blows much more frequently, especially during the gauntlet stages in tandem with health on kill. I was mopping the floor. The surplus of kills this one ability provided me with was enough to make this the best pyro run to date, and it landed us an extremely similar scoreboard as the last mission. 360 kills in another 37 minutes. It took until 95% of the way through the challenge, but we finally managed two back-to-back -back robo blowouts. Even more impressive was that, right near the finishing line, we were within 10 kills of the projected robot number we should have been groaching the whole time. With both bot bash and broken parts on the table, the outcome did look promising, but I wasn't ignorant to how things could go awry. I could end up getting a good loadout, but we queue into a lobby that shits the bed, which already happened several times before. We may have gotten two amazing rolls in a row, but this was an anomaly. Getting three in a row would be unprecedented. Little did I expect the gravy train would keep on pouring. <sighs> okay. Alright. We're good. 
There are very few draws you could want more than a decent sniper rifle with an open broken parts mission. But that intense moment of relief turned into caution once I got a glimpse of my team. Almost everyone was extremely inexperienced, and if I wasn't on my game, we could very easily see a repeat of what happened on mission 38. But right from the jump, I was given a glimmer of optimism. The low tour engineer opted to put his dispenser next to the rock. A move I thought would be so unexpected that I bought three ammo canteens before the wave began. It was clear that he was more knowledgeable than his tour count suggested. This isn't something a new kid off the block will usually do. But still, the other players appeared to be inexperienced, and persistent low tourisms could be the end of us. This fear was emboldened when the pyro player started spamming air blast. But then, something amazing happened. I politely asked the pyro to stop, and he actually apologized. And not only did he immediately recognize his mistake, but he swapped the flog on the following wave to not further tempt himself. But it wasn't just him. I asked my team to be a bit more quick-handed on the F4s, and when I gave that suggestion, everyone readied up within seconds. Getting a team that communicates this well is more rare than the Australians were chasing. It wasn't all easy going, though. We did get pushed back a couple of times, and not gonna lie, I'm still a pretty bad shot when it comes to Sniper. But overall, nothing went seriously wrong. I may have been missing a good chunk of my shots, but once a Robot Heavy got onto the field, I could use them as easy lightning rods for explosive headshots. I used this to great effect in both Waves 4 and Wave 5 especially, but Wave 6? That's where trouble could happen. This wave is a massive difficulty spike that destroys most inexperienced lobbies, and it's not like I could carry much either. I can barely headshot a soldier bot with a wiggling helmet, never mind a dozen super scouts charging forward at Mach 9. If there was any wave that was going to sink us, it would be this one. But I did know that this was a team I could work with. Before the wave began, I informed our pyro about the double tank damage strategy via aiming upwards, and he immediately put that shit into practice. Thanks to the fact he had a working set of eyes, that gave the rest of our team enough leeway to put our crosshairs on the robots that matter. All of the super scouts died pretty much instantly, and while the heavy meta combos did make it far, they didn't get more than two thirds of the way into the map. We made it to the final stage of the wave, all that was left were the 10 soldiers and one of the bulkiest tanks in the game. This is often the point where newer teams just barely lose the round and are demoralized enough to quit. But my team didn't do that. I had completed Wave 6 with almost an entire group of low tours, first try, without any kind of carry on my behalf. They basically did this all on their own, and taking everything into consideration, that was the greatest blessing of them all. The 1 in 9 chance of rolling Sniper was lucky, as was avoiding the bows and the classic. But landing on the most pleasant low tour group I've played with in years, right at the end of the line, that wrapped up our good RNG with a nice little bow. These players have definitely earned their stars, but I haven't earned mine quite yet. Big Rock gave us plenty of kills, 432 to be exact, in a third consecutive 37 minute long mission by the way. But that wasn't enough to clear the challenge. We still had 58 robots left to go, with only 32 minutes left on the clock. Enough for one mission and one mission only. A single question remained, could it be done? Well, come on, of course it can. For the sake of content, I would have loved to have failed Wave 6 over and over again to give the video a more tentative ending, but the low tours, they knocked it out of the park. Even worse was that I apparently didn't hit my record bind when I was rolling for my final loadout, which ended up being this. Do know that as I was going in for my final draw, I said aloud, the only thing that could rob me is the rocket jumper, and had a mini heart attack when the soldier popped up on my screen. In any other circumstance, I'd bitch about the direct hit again, but we're 58 kills away, so who really cares? At least, we were 58 kills away until our team decided to restart the mission at the end of Wave 1, which wipes the scoreboard up to that point. So now the magic number is 21, I guess. From a video perspective, this is the worst chain of events you could get for a satisfying ending, but you've read the title, and you know how this ends. After hours of M1-ing, shield bashing, waiting in queue for 5am big rock lobbies, and yelling at Taiwanese children to F4, we finally, at long last, completed the challenge. 10. 
motherfucking bitch ass thousand robots killed in 24 hours. Shut the fuck up, you stupid bitch. It had been done. With a collective time of 23 hours and 38 minutes, we finally killed 10,000 robots. What a fucking ride. I'll be honest, when conceptualizing this challenge idea, I didn't think we'd come even remotely close to failing. Might sound like I'm huffing copium, but I'm really not. TF2 videos of this ilk tend to go one of two directions. They either have the destination be an inevitability, and the entertainment value is based around whatever wacky hijinks occur, or the challenge itself is punishing enough to where it ends up encompassing most of the video's focus. I, without fail, expected this to be the former, and believed with my entire being that completing this challenge was a foregone conclusion. This is literally why I didn't even bother tryharding in the beginning. I genuinely thought it would make no difference in outcome. As it turns out, I was very, very wrong. There wasn't a single moment where I was ahead of our projected kill count until literally mission 45 out of 46. Before we landed the Scottish resistance combo on Big Rock, it was looking like I'd have to do some kind of clickbait gotcha and end up giving that 24 hours a bit of an asterisk. The whole time I was chalking this up to bad RNG, but hindsight is 2020. When in the moment, you can start to contrive reasons for why you're failing so miserably, even if they don't hold up. So I decided to investigate that quandary. When it came to class selection, we were actually shockingly in line with what was expected. For the three classes we wanted to avoid for this challenge, Scout, Medic, and Spy, we ended up rolling them 15 times out of our 46 total loadouts. Medic was unreasonably high for sure, but our Scout and Spy bids were definitely lower than average. They made up 32.6% of our total loadouts, just 1% shy of what would be expected from a third of the roster. However, just because they were 32.6% of my loadouts didn't mean they were 32.6% of my playtime, right? Actually, wrong. Coincidentally, the playtime added up to literally the exact same number down to the fucking decimal. So, if it wasn't our class selection, what actually nearly fucked us? Well, our loadouts, really. There were a couple of positives. For example, getting the Islander for two out of our three completed demo missions, and of the seven times we rolled Pyro, we not once got the Dragon's Fury, the worst flamethrower crowd control-wise in the game. Frankly though, that's where the good luck ends. And when we look through the other classes, we see an incredible buffet of unfortunate stats. Of the six times I played Soldier, I got the direct hit on three separate occasions. Occasions. And we went 06 on getting even a single banner. Of the four times I played Spy, we didn't land on the Big Earner or the Kunai once. Of the three times I played Scout, we got the bottom half of Scattergun viability every time. And notably, of the eight times we played Medic, we didn't land on the Quick Fix a single time. Heavy is the most consistent class we could get, with every minigun being somewhat viable. And yet, we got him a grand total of once. These are the RPMs generated across each class's total playtime, with good, average, and bad RNG coded green, yellow, and red respectively. As you can see, there's a lot more red than green on this board, and as a result, our RPMs were severely hampered. By all accounts, Soldier should have been our number one robot killer, but because I was strapped with the direct shit half the time, he just barely cracked in fourth place. Spending the whole challenge just waiting and waiting for the moment we'd close the gap was an agonizing experience. One I didn't think I'd reach at all. 22 minutes sounds like a fair bit of leeway, but we were one more bad loadout, one more incompetent team, one more shitty wave one loss away from failing the challenge outright. In the end, what actually saved us was landing on a team that was able to communicate. And I think that's what makes MVM so special. It's not about those 548 beggars killstreaks or trolling some random high tour shitter, it's about friendship, camaraderie,
and pressing the goddamn F4 button, holy fucking shit. Do you know how much of this challenge was spent doing nothing? Just press the fucking button, you goddamn inbred troglodyte fuck. Quick little reminder to check out War Thunder. Again, use my link in the description for all the premium goodies. But that's it. Video over. If you felt like this was worth watching over whatever movie you could find on uTorrent, just know that dropping a like, sub, or a comment about how Vruyi smells bad would go a long way. I'll have a really wholesome surprise at the end of my next video, so be sure to look out for that. But until then, I appreciate you all very much. Twitter and Discord are in the description, and that's all I got. See ya.